Andrew Weissman is going to be joining us tonight with some defendant Trump news. But first, I'm going to tell you the most hopeful story I know. It's a story about the place where Joe Biden went today, the place where Joe Biden was applauded by grateful people from around the world. It's a dangerous place. That is the title of Daniel Patrick Moynihan's book about his service as ambassador to the United Nations in the 1970s before New York voters elected him to four terms in the United States Senate, where I went to work for him in the 1990s. The title, A Dangerous Place, referred to the world and the place where the world began to gather after World War II to prevent another world war, the United Nations. Ambassador Moynihan served at the United Nations at the height of the Cold War when the United States and the Soviet Union had nuclear missiles aimed at each other, ready for launch in seconds. The nuclear threat did not appear to soften Ambassador Moynihan's language about the Soviet Union's imperialistic dictatorship. Many years later, he discovered the power of those harsh words. It was actually my first time visiting the news division in the building where I now work. I was staffing Senator Moynihan for an appearance on the Today Show. It was not long after the collapse of the Soviet Union, something no one in the CIA or the American government had predicted except Senator Moynihan. In 1979, Senator Moynihan said the Soviet Union was economically and socially unsustainable. It could blow up, he said. A dozen years later, it did. Across the large green room full of breakfast snacks and coffee at the Today Show was a, the new Russian delegation to the United Nations, the post-Soviet delegation. The Russian ambassador was scheduled to appear on the Today Show after Senator Moynihan. What happened in that room that morning changed my understanding of the possible. It changed my understanding of the world. And it changed the way I listened to President Biden's final words to the United Nations today. In our corner of that room, Senator Moynihan was whispering to me about the Russians he recognized from almost 20 years ago at the United Nations. He was pointing out the ones he thought maybe were KBG agents then. A producer entered to lead the senator to the set as Senator Moynihan took his first step out of the room with me trailing him in the doorway, a rough-voiced Russian man who was one of the suspected former KGB agents, came rushing up behind me saying something that sounded like Russian over my shoulder to the senator. We turned. He said it again. It wasn't Russian. It was heavily accented English. We still didn't understand it. It was in the middle of the third time, the third time he said it, that I noticed how big his smile was, how admiringly he was looking up at Senator Moynihan, who towered over both of us. Suddenly, the heavily accented words made sense to both of us, and the senator's face broke into the biggest smile I'd ever seen on him. The Russian, possibly former KGB guy, was saying, we were listening. Senator Moynihan looked near tears of joy. I had never seen him so thrilled, or even slightly thrilled for that matter. We both said thank you to the Russian a couple of times. He beamed one more, we were listening. And the senator then had to fly on to the Today Show set. We were listening, meaning when you stood up in what seemed like the most hopeless and ineffectual protests against what the Soviet Union was doing, the Soviet Union was listening. Some of us were listening. We were listening. It was a validation of Daniel Patrick Moynihan's life's work, first as a teacher, a Harvard professor, trying to impart important knowledge without ever really knowing if those kids are really listening, then as ambassador to India before becoming ambassador to the United Nations, then as a senator. We Were Listening was all the professor, ambassador, senator was ever hoping for. 
That's the first thing, the most important thing, the necessary thing, listening. Because if they are listening, maybe we can solve this problem. Maybe we can solve the biggest problems. Maybe we can end wars. Maybe we can save lives. Maybe we can make a dangerous place less dangerous. The Soviet Union existed for Daniel Patrick Moynihan's entire lifetime before it collapsed. The Berlin Wall existed for my entire lifetime before it collapsed. People were shot dead in their tracks for almost 50 years for trying to cross the Berlin Wall and escape the Soviet-controlled dictatorship of East Germany. People got executed on the spot trying to climb that wall because that wall coming down was unimaginable. No one dared to hope that that wall would come down. People died trying to climb that wall because they believed it would never come down. The Berlin Wall was permanent, and UN ambassadors like Munihan would protest it, but nothing would happen. But something was happening. They were listening. No one knew they were listening. Unfortunately, you usually have to be old to know that things can change, to know that the hopeless can turn hopeful. The World War II generation knew this. The Vietnam generation learned this. And so when we look at our most hopeless problems in the world today, the ones where it feels like we are making absolutely no progress month after month, sometimes year after year, we should know that those problems aren't more hopeless than the Berlin Wall was. They aren't more hopeless than the Vietnam War was. So now when you listen to an old man who has seen it all give his last speech today to the United Nations, you might, you might want to try listening to him the way I do, with an understanding of how he learned to be hopeful. I listened to him today with the hope that I earned in that green room at the Today Show 30 years ago. The hope, just the hope, that they are listening. The hope that people on opposite sides of the issues at the United Nations and elsewhere are listening and that someday they will find each other. And maybe, just maybe, because they were listening, they will find a way to end wars, to save lives. My fellow leaders, today is the fourth time I've had the great honor of speaking to this assembly as President of the United States. It'll be my last. I've seen a remarkable sweep of history. I was first elected office in the United States of America as a U.S. Senator in 1972. Now, I know I look like I'm only 40. I know that. <laughs> I was 29 years old. Back then, we were living through an inflection point, a moment of tension and uncertainty. The world was divided by the Cold War. The Middle East was headed toward war. America was at war in Vietnam, at that point, the longest war in America's history. Our country was divided and angry, and there were questions about our staying power and our future. But even then, I entered public life not out of despair, but out of optimism. The United States and the world got through that moment. It wasn't easy or simple, without significant setbacks. But we go on to reduce the threat of nuclear weapons throughout the, uh, through arms control, and then go on to bring the Cold War itself to an end. Israel and Egypt went to war, but then forged a historic peace. We ended the war in Vietnam. The last year in Hanoi, I was met with the Vietnamese leadership. We elevated our partnership to the highest level. 
It's a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the capacity for reconciliation. That today, the United States and Vietnam are partners and friends. And it's proof that even from the horrors of war, there is a way forward. Things can get better. We should never forget that. I've seen that throughout my career. In the 1980s, I spoke out against apartheid in South Africa. And then I watched the racist regime fall. When I came to office as president, Afghanistan had replaced Vietnam as America's longest war. I was determined to end it, and I did. It was a hard decision, but the right decision. Four American presidents had faced that decision, but I was determined not to leave it to the fifth. It was a decision accompanied by tragedy. Thirteen brave Americans lost their lives, along with hundreds of Afghans in a suicide bomb. I think those lost lives, I think of them every day. I think of all the 2,461 U.S. military deaths over a long 20 years of that war. 20,744 American servicemen wounded in action. I think of their service, their sacrifice, and their heroism. I know many look at the world today and see difficulties and react with despair, but I do not. I won't. As leaders, we don't have the luxury. I recognize the challenges from Ukraine to Gaza to Sudan and beyond. War, hunger, terrorism, brutality, record displacement of people, the climate crisis, democracy at risk, strange in our societies, the promise of artificial intelligence and its significant risk. The list goes on. But maybe because all I've seen and all we have done together over the decades, I have hope. I know there is a, w a way forward. There will always be forces that pull our countries apart and the world apart. Aggression, extremism, chaos, and cynicism. A desire to retreat from the world and go it alone. To start, each of us in this body has made a commitment to the principles of the UN Charter to stand up against aggression. When Russia invaded Ukraine, we could have stood by and merely protested. But Vice President Harris and I understood that that was an assault on everything this institution is supposed to stand for. We cannot grow weary. We cannot look away. And we will not let up on our support for Ukraine. Not until Ukraine wins a just and durable peace on the UN Charter. Thousands of armed Hamas terrorists invaded a sovereign state, slaughtering and massacring more than 1,200 people, including 46 Americans, in their homes and at a music festival. Despicable, despicable acts of sexual violence, 250 innocents taken hostage. I've met with the families of those hostages. I've grieved with them. They're going through hell. Innocent civilians in Gaza are also going through hell. Thousands and thousands of kills, including aid workers. Too many families dislocated, crowding into tents, facing a dire humanitarian situation. They did not ask for this war that Hamas started. I put forward with Qatar and Egypt a ceasefire and hostage deal. It's been endorsed by the UN Security Council. Now is the time for the parties to finalize its terms. Bring the hostages home to secure security for Israel and Gaza free of Hamas grip. Ease the suffering in Gaza and end this war. On October 7th, <laughs> as we look ahead, we must also address the rise of violence against innocent Palestinians on the West Bank and set the conditions for a better future including a two-state solution where the world, where Israel enjoys security and peace and full recognition and normalized relations with all its neighbors, where Palestinians live in security, dignity, and self-determination in a state of their own. <laughs> Gaza is not the only conflict that deserves our outrage. In Sudan, a bloody civil war unleashed one of the world's worst humanitarian crises. 
Eight million, eight million on the brink of famine. Hundreds of thousands already there. Atrocities in Darfur and elsewhere. The United States has led the world in providing humanitarian aid to Sudan. And with our partners, we've led diplomatic talks to try to silence the guns and avert, and avert a wider famine. The world needs to stop arming the generals, to speak with one voice and tell them, stop tearing your country apart, stop blocking aid to the Sudanese people, end this war now. The U.N. needs to adapt and bring new voices and new perspectives. That's why we support reforming and expanding the membership of the U.N. Security Council. We the people. These are the first words of our Constitution, the very idea of America. They inspired the opening words of the U.N. Charter. I made the preservation of democracy the central cause of my presidency. This summer, I faced a decision whether to seek a second term as president. It was a difficult decision. Being president has been the honor of my life. There's so much more I want to get done. As much as I love the job, I love my country more. I decided after 50 years of public service, it's time for a new generation of leadership to take my nation forward. My fellow leaders, let us never forget some things are more important than staying in power. It's your people. It's your people that matter the most. That's the soul of democracy. It does not belong to any one country. I've seen it all around the world, in the brave men and women who ended apartheid, brought down the Berlin Wall, fight today for freedom and justice and dignity. Nelson Mandela taught us, and I quote, it always seems impossible until it's done. It always seems impossible until it's done. My fellow leaders, there's nothing that's beyond our capacity if we work together. Let's work together. God bless you all, and may God protect all those who seek peace. Thank you. It always seems impossible until it's done. So true. Coming up. Tonight, Donald Trump is afraid, very afraid, of what is in Special Prosecutor Jack Smith's 180-page brief that will be filed on Thursday. Andrew Weissman and Melissa Murray, join us next. At the end of this hour, we're going to show you something very special that happened at the White House on Friday afternoon. But first... The breaking defendant Trump news of the night is that federal judge Chanya Chutkin has ruled that special prosecutor Jack Smith will be allowed to file a 180-page brief in excess of the ordinary 45-page limit in order to prove to Judge Chutkin that the new indictment of Donald Trump by a second grand jury charging him with conspiracy against the United States to overthrow the last presidential election leading up to and on January 6th meets the Supreme Court's new guidelines about presidential immunity for Donald Trump. Jack Smith says that the comprehensive brief is necessary for the judge to determine how the Supreme Court ruling on immunity applies to the case. Donald Trump's lawyers tried to prevent that 180-page uh, brief from be being filed. It's due on Thursday of this week at 5 p.m. by arguing that the brief itself would be prejudicial to their client. Judge Chutkin rejected the Trump argument, saying, first, he protests that the government aims to proffer their untested and biased views to the court and the public as if they are conclusive. But allowing a brief from the government is not 
contrary to law, procedure, and custom, as defendant claims, citing no authority. It is simply how litigation works. Each side presents arguments and proffers evidence on disputed issues here, whether defendants charged conduct involved official acts and receives immunity. The judge noted that the Trump lawyers will be allowed to offer evidence in their brief that is helpful to Donald Trump if they have it. The judge said, a party's factual proffer does not conclusively establish anything. It merely provides evidence for the judicial fact finder to consider. The Trump lawyers also told the judge, quote, it's incredibly unfair in the sense that they're able to put in the public record at this very sensitive time in our nation's history. Judge Chutkin said that the timing of the election that the Trump lawyers were obviously referring to has no bearing on this case. The judge wrote, defendants' concern with the political consequences of these proceedings does not bear on the pretrial schedule. What needs to happen before or shouldn't happen before the election is not relevant here. Joining our discussion now is NYU Law Professor team of Andrew Weissman and Melissa Murray. They are co-authors of the Trump Indictments, the Historic Charging Documents with Commentary, and are both MSNBC legal analysts. Uh, Andrew, it looks like uh, we could be reading something fascinating on Thursday night. Well, thank you for having the NYU faculty yes. meeting on yes. air tonight. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this is, as you noted, Donald Trump, this is actually his third effort to try to have no facts submitted to the court. Um, he wants to live in that fact-free zone that he campaigns in, but this is a court of law, and Judge Chutkin would have none of it. It's really quite a polite but scathing uh, decision by the judge saying, I'm going to go forward because this is the rule of law that is going to be imposed here. Uh, and so on Thursday, what we can expect is a submission that is going to include, according to the government, very detailed factual evidence about the case and about why, as uh, Jack Smith will say, this is material that is either personal in nature or overcomes a presumption of immunity um, and thus can go forward. Now, some of the evidence could be redacted, could be marked sensitive, and then there will be some time before we actually see that, if ever, but the judge will decide what to do with that redacted portion. Uh, Melissa Murray, what, what are examples of things that the judge might want to redact? Well, information that the public hasn't yet seen, information that might perhaps be viewed as influencing the upcoming election, it, it's hard to say. Um, obviously, there's some evidence that has already been disclosed that we don't really know about because we've not yet seen it. But there's also new evidence here. And again, that new evidence has been added in response to the Supreme Court's decision. So again, with very little guidance from the court on how to apply that immunity decision, both Judge Chutkin and Jack Smith are basically trying to structure this in the best way possible. So it's not surprising that she was so receptive to a more fulsome brief with more evidence, but also with some guardrails here to protect the defendant going forward. And Andrew, this is precisely what the Supreme Court ordered. They sent the case back to the trial judge with an order saying, do some fact finding and find out whether uh, the facts in this case uh, fit uh, the the immunity decision that we are handing you. Absolutely. And Judge Chutkin made that point. She said, I'm doing exactly yeah. what the Supreme Court said I should do. And you, defendant Trump, were the ones who went to the Supreme Court and that you got this or ruling from them. And now I am carrying it out. And at one point she says, you know, your brief to me says that I'm going too fast. And you also say I'm going too slow. Um, it, it basically is just, you know, not to, you know, pun intended, but spaghetti at the wall. Um, and uh, this is one where I really do think we will get a lot of information. But I, I think uh, one of the things we will not get is probably certain names of witnesses, the kind of information that the government has been sensitive to, um, to make sure that there aren't people who are going to be put in danger um, as we have seen with respect to a whole host of people, whether they're witnesses, uh, election officials, uh, people who work for the prosecutor or the court office, 
um, jurors, those kinds of names are the kinds of things they think um, we may not see on Thursday. My dear professors, please stay with us because on the other side of this commercial break, I want to take a look at what happened in the Senate Judiciary Committee today where they were considering the Supreme Court's ruling on presidential immunity. I want to get your reactions to that. We'll be right back. The decision is profoundly wrong and it is profoundly dangerous. It essentially licenses a president to abuse his power and to get away with it. That was a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing today to consider the implications of the Supreme Court's decision to grant Donald Trump criminal immunity from prosecution for official acts as president. What would stop a president from directing the investigation of his political enemies, journalists, or activists, even where there is no basis for doing so? Could that sham investigation include directing the FBI to engage in unlawful surveillance, or bypass seeking a warrant to search a home or workplace, or to target individuals or groups based on race or religion? If the president were to bring a civil suit against the Department of Justice, as the former president has provided notice that he intends to do, could he order the department to settle the case for millions of dollars, even if the suit itself were baseless? No potential criminal prosecution would prevent the president from directing the IRS to launch baseless criminal investigations. Likewise, no potential criminal prosecution would prevent the president from using the CIA for domestic operations. Still with us, Andrew Weissman and Melissa Murray. Uh, uh, Melissa, the, uh, this was such an interesting hearing. This was what the Supreme Court uh, hearing should have been. It seemed like there were questions that were so obvious and issues so obvious that were dealt with here that were not dealt with in oral argument at the Supreme Court. Well, I recall oral argument actually being quite robust, Lawrence, and certainly the liberals on the court, and even Justice Barrett asked some very probing questions. In fact, Justice Barrett cornered Donald Trump's lawyer, John Sauer, into making a series of concessions that should have been devastating for Trump's case. I think the real issue was in the writing of that majority opinion, the Chief Justice rejected opportunities and overtures to write a narrower, more minimalist opinion, and instead wrote a very sweeping opinion. And that's in addition to running out the clock on writing that very sweeping opinion such that it was virtually impossible for this case to actually get to trial before the election. And of course, the opinion itself made it absolutely impossible that many of these charges would be able to be heard. So now it's back with Judge Chutkin. And we are seeing now that the Senate Judiciary Committee has real questions about the court, and they should. Let's listen to some of uh, Senator Peter Welch's questioning of one of the Republican witnesses. Why in the world would the president of the United States, who's got a lot of things to deal with, decide that person A or person B should have the IRS go after them? How in the world, in what world would that be legitimate? It is not legitimate, as I said. So should he, he or she get immunity for that? No. All right. What about... Uh, the professor's recitation of Nixon's focus on going after Jews in government. Again, no. So no immunity for that. Correct. But under this decision, professor. I think this is what's left open by the decision because the Supreme Court capaciously defined these core constitutional powers as absolutely immune. Uh, Andrew Weissman, I don't see anything in the decision that prevents uh, Donald Trump from sitting in the White House reading any tax return he wants uh, of anyone in the country who he hates uh, and then ordering uh, an investigation and prosecution. Um, so th you play the clip, which was really remarkable, because that is um, the senator, the junior senator from Vermont, who basically flipped the Trump witness, who is the former attorney general, um, and got him to concede that he thinks it would be improper and a president should not be immune from using the tax department to go after people, to go after people based on religion. But you are right. If you look at the Supreme Court decision, um, it says that the president is absolutely immune for ordering the Department of Justice to engage in sham investigations 
I mean, it, to say it is to refute it. And he got the attorney general, former attorney general of the United States, to agree. Um, and it really was a, sort of a surprising moment that that's something that should not be immune. But it is pretty clear from this decision that there certainly is no language in the decision that would prevent that horrendous outcome. And as Melissa Murray likes to say, if you need reason to think that the Supreme Court is on the ballot, this is one more reason. Uh, one of the things that uh, an immunity de description can include is what you're not immune uh, from, what, what you're not protected from. And Senator Sheldon Whitehouse on the committee today pointed out that the Supreme Court wrote this decision and did not, did not exempt treason from immunity. Uh, Professor Murray, they, the, apparently treason is, is an open question now about uh, how that might apply to a president. Well, the thing that's so great about this opinion, and I mean great in a completely snarky way, um, is that it offers up three categories here. So there's the core powers category that's entirely immune from criminal prosecution. There are the unofficial acts that are presumably able to be prosecuted. But then there's this big murky middle of official conduct that's not necessarily core powers, but that enjoys a presumption of immunity. And the opportunity to rebut that presumption really requires considerable evidence. And the court doesn't really talk about what would actually rebut that presumption. So that's where most of the action is going to be. I think a lot of the action for Judge Chutkin. And there aren't a lot of guidance and guardrails here that the court has given her in order to do that. And so I think treason, according to Senator Whitehouse, is one of those things that might fall in the realm of official conduct, depending on how you think about it. And it might actually enjoy the presumption of immunity unless it could be rebutted by some very high standard that we don't really even have knowledge of at this point from the opinion. And uh, Andrew, it seemed to me that the discussion at the uh, Judiciary Committee today was more careful than what I was hearing from the Republican judges, certainly on the Supreme Court, when they were considering this. Well, there definitely was an effort by the Republican witnesses and senators to sort of downplay the import of the decision. Uh, and then that's, that's something that Chief Justice Roberts tried to do at the end of his decision. But there, you know, throughout the main part of the majority, there, this is not a very timid decision. Um, it should be noted, not only did they have, it, as, as Mary McCord noted, a very, very expansive view of what are core presidential powers, but as Melissa noted, even with that middle category for official conduct, the court said that it's entitled to at least a presumption of immunity, meaning that later the court could decide, actually, we're going to make it absolutely immune. And the test, as Melissa noted, for how to rebut it is a really high standard. Um, and so that's, I agree, is where the action will be. But this decision is really a reason to have somebody sitting in the Oval Office who shows restraint. Andrew Weissman and Melissa Murray, thank you both very much for joining our discussion tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. And a programming note, you can join Melissa Murray and Simone Sanders Townsend for an MSNBC special, Black Women in America, The Road to 2024. That's Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern, right here on MSNBC. And coming up at the end of the hour, you'll hear what the former fictional president, Martin Sheen, had to say at the White House on Friday. And next, we'll be joined by the leader of Arizona Republicans for Harris, Mayor John Giles, and find out what he's telling Arizona voters in the final days of the campaign. That's next. I have a confession to make. I'm a lifelong Republican. So I feel a little out of place tonight. But I feel more at home here than in today's Republican Party. The grand old party has been kidnapped by extremists and devolved into a cult. The cult of Donald Trump. We have never seen anything like it. Prominent members of one party lining up to endorse the presidential candidate of the other party. Today, Arizona Republicans for Harris announced 90 nine zero new endorsements. The Harris Walls campaign has released a new ad featuring swing state lifelong Republicans.
who are now voting for the Democrat. Bob and I both voted for Donald Trump. I voted for him twice. I won't vote for him again. January 6th was a wake-up call for me. Donald Trump divides people. We've already seen what he has to bring. He didn't do anything to help us. Kamala Harris, she cares about the American people. I think she's got the wherewithal to make a difference. I've never voted for a Democrat. Yes, yes. we're both lifelong Republicans. The choice is very simple. I'm voting for Kamala. I am voting for Kamala Harris. Joining us now, the Republican mayor of Mesa, Arizona, John Giles. He is the co-chair of the Arizona Republicans for Harris Waltz Advisory Committee. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for joining us tonight. I was quite struck uh, seeing you speak at the Democratic Convention. I can't imagine what that was like for you as a Republican to do that. Uh, but more importantly, as we come into the final days of the campaign, what are you saying to Arizona voters who you know aren't yet in the spot you are and ready to vote for Kamala Harris? Well, thanks for the opportunity to be here, Lawrence. I'm having a lot of those, exactly those conversations. There are a lot of people like myself that are lifelong Republicans that for decades uh, have, have felt very comfortable in the Republican Party, but, but feel now somewhat homeless when it comes to, to politics. And, uh, and many of, the, of those folks, uh, as I have those conversations, they'll begin with the premise that, yes, Donald Trump is horrible. Uh, we, 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 voted, we held our nose to vote for him in the past. We can't do it again uh, for a, a million reasons, character, integrity, uh, the, abandoning the rule of law. You know, the, the list goes on. They'll concede at the outset of these conversations that he's a bad choice. But for many uh, lifelong Republicans, getting across the bridge to voting for a Democrat for the, at the top of the ticket is a bridge that's a little bit too far. So my job is to try to help them realize that Kamala Harris is a great alternative, uh, that she's someone who will govern from the, from the middle. She's someone that is focused on solving problems. Uh, and she is uh, head and shoulders a better alternative than, than Donald Trump. So, you know, I'm a, a lifelong uh, voter whose presidential vote has never mattered because I've been registered in the following states in this order, Massachusetts, New York, California. Uh, it was going for the Democrat every single time. Uh, and it didn't matter whether I added my vote to that or not. I can't imagine what it's like to have the right to vote in Arizona and what a high privilege that is. Do Arizona voters understand that their votes count so much more than mine ever could? Uh, they do, because it's it's wall-to-wall -wall, uh, political ads here. We're, we're con and for the last couple of cycles, Lawrence, we, we've had very, very close elections. As you know, uh, Biden won by, by 10,000 votes here four years ago. Two years ago, we had a state uh, attorney general election. Out of millions of votes were cast, the Democrat won by less than 300 votes in a statewide election. So everyone here is, is painfully aware of how evenly divided we are and that all eyes are on Arizona. Uh, what are you getting from Republicans who are angry about what you've done? Well, predictably, you know, the, you know, MAGA people uh, seem to, to not take kindly to people disagreeing with them. So there, there has been you know, uh, plenty of that. But I've been, frankly, far more taken back by the positive reaction that I've gotten from people. Uh, I can't go to the grocery store or, or walk out of my office without people stopping me and saying, you don't know me, but I'm a, I'm a Republican, and thank you for giving voice to the feelings that I've been having about this election and about the, the direction of the Republican Party. Mayor John Giles, thank you very much for joining our discussion tonight. Thank you. And my dear friend, Martin Sheen, will get tonight's last word. That's next. On Friday at the White House, the First Lady celebrated the 25th anniversary of the debut of NBC's fictional White House series, The West Wing, created by Aaron Sorkin, who joined a few of the cast members for the celebration at the White House. The Marine Band played Snuffy Walden's Emmy-winning theme music, and the inspiring fictional president 
of that White House, Martin Sheen, said this. I am given this opportunity rare enough these days to morph once again into the wonderful character that changed my life and a lot of others as well, uh, Jed Bartlett. Uh, so thank you, Aaron, for this opportunity. You know, the, uh, the Irish tell the story of a man who arrives at the gates of heaven and asks to be let in. St. Peter says, of course, just show us your scars. The man says, I have no scars. St. Peter says, what a pity. Was there nothing worth fighting for? We are rightly called to find something in our lives worth fighting for, something deeply personal and uncompromising, something that can unite the will of the spirit with the work of the flesh. And when we find that, we will discover fire for the second time. And then we will be able to help lift up this nation and all its people to that place where the heart is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depths of truth and tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sands of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever-widening thought and action into that heaven of freedom, dear Father. Let our country awake. Amen. Martin Sheen gets tonight's last word.